Hello, I am Dr. Keith Burke, a professor of behavioral sciences in the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies program at San Diego City College. The AODS program is a vocational or job training program for students who desire to become certified alcohol and drug counselors in the state of California. It is also a fully accredited college coursework program in which the classes that students take for their AODS training count towards further academic goals as well. Today, I am going to be talking about screening and assessing for co-occurring disorders in substance use treatment facilities. As this lecture is primarily designed for alcohol and drug counselors who are working in substance use treatment facilities, when referring to screening and assessing for co-occurring disorders, we are primarily talking about uh, disorders that are co-occurring with the substance use disorder. While any kind of disorder that co-occurs could be um, termed a co-occurring disorder, primarily our concern in substance use treatment is mental health disorders that are co-occurring with the substance use treatment. This lecture will primarily be talking about screening and assessing for mental health disorders by alcohol and drug counselors who are in a substance use treatment facility. A basic screening for co-occurring disorders is an initial evaluation, so happening early in the client's treatment, typically, that's attempting to determine whether or not a client does or does not warrant further attention and assessment regarding the possibility of a co-occurring substance use and mental health disorder. The screening process for a co-occurring disorder in a substance use treatment facility is seeking to answer a yes or no question. Does the substance use treatment client also show signs of a possible mental health problem? If the answer is yes, then we move on. If the answer is no, then we would stop the screening and assessing process. The screening process is kind of a first pass, if you will, and it does not necessarily identify what kind of problem the person might have or how serious it might be. The purpose of the screening is simply to determine whether or not further assessment is warranted. Now, there is some confusion out there in the field even today about what drug and alcohol counselors can and cannot do within their scope of practice. So in the United States, as dictated by SAMHSA, the Federal Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration, which sets policy for substance use and mental health treatment in the United States, a mental health training, a mental health screening can absolutely be conducted by alcohol and drug counselors using their basic counseling skills. There are seldom any legal or professional restraints on who can be trained to conduct a mental health screening. The alcohol and drug counselor is also generally going to spend more time with the clients in a substance use treatment facility. They will have more formal and informal counseling sessions and interventions, and the alcohol and drug counselor often builds a stronger relationship with more rapport because of the amount of time that they spend with clients then will any other professional treating clients in a substance use treatment facility. That includes psychiatrists and mental health clinicians. So if the facility employs mental health clinicians and psychiatrists, typically the mental health clinicians and definitely the psychiatrists are not running the same number of groups as an alcohol and drug counselor. They're not seeing the clients nearly as often as a drug and alcohol counselor. So the alcohol and drug counselor is the primary point of contact for most clients in a substance use treatment facility. The alcohol and drug counselor can conduct screenings and assessments for co-occurring disorders. And in doing so, drug and alcohol counselors can identify existing and former or past mental health symptoms. Drug and alcohol counselors can ask about current and past psychiatric medications. Drug and alcohol counselors can form initial diagnostic impressions that are consistent with mental health disorders, meaning that a drug and alcohol counselor may recognize symptoms that the client is showing as consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, and they are absolutely allowed to share those observations as part of a screening process. An alcohol and drug counselor can recommend additional mental health assessments, and an alcohol and drug counselor can refer to a licensed mental health clinician. 
Essentially, an alcohol and drug counselor can do everything that any other clinician or counselor can when it comes to attempting to determine, does this client have mental health symptoms that may warrant from further assessment? The only thing that an alcohol and drug counselor cannot do is make a formal psychiatric mental health diagnosis for the purposes of medical records, insurance billing, or legal matters, meaning that the drug and alcohol counselor cannot do a screening or an assessment and then write in the client's medical record, I have determined that this client has post-traumatic stress disorder. The alcohol and drug counselor also cannot use formal diagnostic labels in documentation as part of a conclusion, meaning that after an alcohol and drug counselor completes a screening, they cannot write, I conclude that the client has major depressive disorder. That does not mean that they cannot write down diagnostic impressions. So the client can absolutely say, this client has symptoms consistent with depression, and would benefit from further mental health treatment. Or this client has symptoms that are consistent with PTSD and would benefit from further mental health assessment and treatment. It is, it is simply a, a legal um, formality that an alcohol and drug counselor cannot do formal diagnoses, but pretty much an alcohol and drug counselor can do anything else as it relates to mental health symptoms, mental health screening, mental health um, assessment, and ultimately mental health treatment, which is the topic of some additional lectures. The bottom line is that the alcohol and drug counselor will likely be the, the frontline staff member who will see concerns first, and the alcohol and drug counselor is responsible, both ethically and in some cases legally, for determining if a client might have a mental health con condition, and the alcohol and drug counselor needs to take the steps to initiate whatever it is that's going to happen next. Let's talk then about screening for co-occurring disorders. So screening for co-occurring disorders in a substance use treatment facility is typically a relatively brief process of gathering or identifying information that may determine if the client might be experiencing or showing signs of mental health or medical symptoms. Now, again, principally, we are concerned with screening for mental health symptoms in substance use treatment. Most of the time, if the client has a co-occurring medical condition, that's going to be very obvious. And most of the time, they will either already be working with a physician or it'll be a, a simple matter of connecting them to a physician. But the mental health symptoms often look like a substance use disorder and vice versa. A substance use disorder could look like mental health symptoms. So the screening process is to try and determine, is this person showing signs that are consistent with some kind of mental health symptoms? And if so, whether or not that client would benefit from additional mental health or medical assessment. Also, a screening process for a co-occurring disorder is, is also trying to determine whether or not there are other issues that may affect the client's need for treatment. Uh, meaning that in a screening process, if the client first comes walking in the door, we may try to determine if the client is homeless or are they stable at this point? Uh, does there need to be child welfare services? In the process of doing a screening, do we determine that a child may be potentially being uh, abused or harmed, in which case we need to involve CWS? The goals for screening for a co-occurring disorder is to detect or confirm current mental health, substance use, and medical symptoms, including cognitive deficits. We are trying to ask the client about their history and or previous mental health diagnoses as it relates to the symptoms, and we're trying to identify any acute needs. So let's talk for a second about what this looks like. When the goal of doing a screening is to detect or confirm mental health symptoms, uh, that simply is trying to determine, does this client have some kind of mental health symptoms? So if a client walks into our treatment program and the first uh, meeting we have with the client to go over a biopsychosocial or get some basic demographic information, and the client is showing themselves looking down and hopeless and lacking energy. Well, these could be consistent, 
gosh, I'm having a hard time talking today, I'm sorry. These symptoms could be consistent with depression. So that would be detecting or confirming whether or not there are symptoms that are consistent with depression. Asking the client about a history or previous mental health diagnoses may be as simple as saying, hey, well, you look like you're feeling kind of down and, and low energy and, and sad today. I'm wondering, do, do you experience depression? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever been diagnosed with depression before? Yeah, I've had depression my whole life. All right. And have you ever received treatment for depression or do you take any medications for depression? Uh, I've been prescribed medications before, but I'm not currently taking any medications. Okay. And then this last part here, identifying acute needs that may need immediate attention. A screening may entail asking a client, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Which would be screening for suicidal ideation. So when we're talking about screening, we're simply basically saying that the drug and alcohol counselor is asking questions to move forward to try and determine, are there symptoms? Do we know anything about those symptoms? And what's the level of need or risk regarding those symptoms? In addition, when we're screening, we are trying to determine the level of functional impairment. Functional impairment is really important. Uh, typically, clients with substance use disorders are going to have symptoms of depression and anxiety as they are first detoxing or withdrawing from the substance use. This is part of the, the natural healing process of the brain as the brain tries to come back uh, to a state of baseline or the condition it was in prior to developing a substance use disorder. Uh, depression and anxiety are very commonly associated with post-acute withdrawal symptoms or symptoms that happen after the client goes through acute withdrawal. So if a client is having some depression or anxiety, right, the depression is, yeah, I'm really depressed that I'm in treatment and that my life became unmanageable and that it caused all kinds of negative consequences. What we're trying to do is determine the functional impairment, meaning does that depression actually get in the way of the client functioning at what would be considered a, a normal or a baseline level? So if a client is feeling depressed, but they're still able to engage in treatment, go to groups, talk to their counselor, uh, work on treatment goals, develop a relapse prevention plan, et cetera, et cetera, then it's probably not functionally impairing. But if the depression is such that the person can't get out of bed and that's causing them to miss groups, then that would be functionally impairing. Or the client may have hygiene problems. Uh, related to the depression, that would be functionally impairing. So a screening is trying to determine not only are there symptoms, but what is the level of severity of those symptoms and how impairing are they? We also attempt to identify any other factors that may be contributing to the symptoms. So if the client is sitting in my office and is showing signs consistent with depression, it says like, God, I'm just having like the worst time and we ask, wow, what's happening? And they say, I just talked to my wife and my dog has cancer and it sounds like she's gonna have to put him down and I'm here in treatment. Well, okay, that would be a factor that certainly could be contributing to why my client is feeling depressed. And again, that would be important information if we're trying to determine whether or not this client might have depression and would benefit from further assessments and treatment for that. And we also, in the end, are trying to determine if we need a more comprehensive mental health or medical assessment. And if so, we're gonna provide a referral. So if my client with symptoms who is con that are consistent with depression is also showing functional impairment, and it is likely that these symptoms of depression are going to get in the way the way of my client's ability to complete substance use treatment, then I'm going to provide a referral for further assessment to determine what the next steps should be as to how we can treat that depression. Now, in integrated treatment when treating co-occurring disorders, any kind of referral should be a warm handoff, meaning that I'm not going to write down on a piece of paper uh, the name of some clinician across town and say to my client, well, here, uh, maybe you should get assessed for depression. Uh, call this person. I don't know if they're accepting clients or not, uh, but maybe they can help. Instead, the warm handoff is to actually connect my client with someone who will be able to help them with the next steps whether that's further assessment or whether that's crisis uh, intervention or what have you. All right. 
So in doing a screening, there are two types of screenings that an alcohol and drug counselor will participate in. The first is a formal screening. Now, SAMHSA, the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, uh, strongly recommends that a formal mental health screening is included in all intakes for clients who enter substance use treatment facilities, and the state of California has adopted that recommendation. So that if an agency is certified or licensed by the state of California to provide substance use treatment, it is a requirement that part of the intake asks questions or does a formal screening to try and determine whether or not there may be mental health symptoms or a history of mental health symptoms. Typically in doing a formal screening, these are standardized questionnaires, meaning that the same clients are all asked the same standard questions. And when you do a formal screening, typically the answer to those questions produce uh, cutoff scores. A cutoff score could be something as simple as if the client says yes to this question, then that means that they should be assessed further. If the client says no to this question, then they probably don't need to be assessed further. Uh, sometimes cutoff scores may be if the client answers three or more of the following questions, then they would uh, should be referred to for further assessment. If they answer less than these three questions, then they shouldn't. Uh, every treatment agency I know of in San Diego County, uh, where I'm located, has questions on their intakes about mental health. And they are often uh, just simple questions like, have you ever been diagnosed with a mental health disorder? If so, what is that disorder? Are you currently having mental health symptoms? Uh, there may be some questions about then the major mental health domains, meaning uh, depression, anxiety, trauma, psychotic symptoms, et cetera. So formal screenings are fairly easy for the alcohol and drug counselor to do. For the most part, you're just gonna follow whatever the standardized questionnaire is and ask the requisite follow-up questions. But most of the screening for a co-occurring disorder are going to happen informally. Typically, when clients enter substance use treatment and they do an initial intake assessment, there is often some uh, resistance or reticence or concern about sharing too much information. And many times these formal questions may lead to a no answer, meaning that if the client is asked, have you ever had a mental health condition? Have you ever been given a diagnosis? Are you having symptoms consistent with uh, you know, psychosis? The answer is no. Uh, I've done these standardized questionnaires before where a client, it, it's a yes and no column. The client simply circles no and draws a line all the way down the page. So that initial formal screening would suggest no, there is no mental health symptoms, thus no reason for further assessment. But we're gonna have plenty of opportunity to continue interacting with that client through the course of their substance use treatment. And just because they said no when they came in the door doesn't mean definitively they do not have a mental health co-occurring disorder. So an informal screening is done more on the fly, if you will, meaning that the alcohol and drug counselor will ask questions and interview the client based on their presentation. Uh, if a client is in a group counseling setting in a process group, let's say, or a psychoeducational group um, about trauma, and as the counselor is talking about symptoms of trauma, the client is showing all kinds of anxiety, sitting in their chair, and tears are starting to roll down her face, then that presentation would indicate that she may be triggered or somehow is relating to the lesson on trauma, in which case we would do an informal screening with that client. We would follow up with them after group, or we may ask them in the group, depending upon the circumstance, about the reaction they're having to the topic, and from that, attempt to determine, has this client experienced trauma and is this trauma in fact consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder or otherwise impairing them in their treatment? Uh, in these cases, there are no formal questions. It's not as if the alcohol and drug counselor in group uh, says, oh, wait a second, and runs out of the room and grabs a formal questionnaire and comes running back in and now says to the client, can I ask you these questions? 
Instead, an informal screening is just asking the questions that are the right questions. Hey, you appear to be showing, you know, that you're having a reaction to this. Hey, I'm noticing that you look like this. Hey, can you tell me what's going on? And then following up with, wow, have you ever been treated for trauma symptoms before? Yeah, I talked about it in my last treatment facility. Okay, has anybody ever talked to you about PTSD before? Yeah, they said I had that at my last treatment facility. Ah, uh, who gave you that diagnosis? Uh, the psychiatrist there. Okay, have you ever taken medications or had any kind of formal treatment? Yeah, you know, they put me on some kind of medications. I don't remember what it was, and they were doing EMDR with me. Now, in this case, the questions are informal and on the fly based upon what we're seeing the client present. Uh, informal screenings often can also be based on observations in the milieu or in the environment that the client is in. So uh, we may say a client who is isolating or withdrawn or showing low energy or not participating, uh, and then that may warrant doing an informal screening, following up with the client. Hey, this is what I'm noticing. Can I ask you some questions? Uh, we may overhear conversations or comments from the client concerning mental health symptoms. So the client may have come in and on the formal screening, they said no to any questions related to mental health. Uh, but then in group, they make a comment saying, yeah, I've had a lot of trauma in my life too, and it's really messed me up. Okay, in that case, we're gonna want to do follow-up questions or an informal screening to try and determine more about what this client means by that. Or sometimes in re residential programs or facilities where the clients are living, as well as getting treatment, uh, we may overhear a conversation in the lunchroom or in the hallway or between two clients that may suggest that the client has something going on that would benefit from further questioning. Uh, sometimes too, informal screenings are done after you get collateral information or observations from the clinical team, meaning somebody else may have overheard something or saw something. Maybe this is your client and in group, uh, earlier on during the day, the client had a reaction to a discussion of trauma and that facilitator comes up to you and says, hey, I didn't get a chance to follow up with the client, uh, but he was reacting today as if he's, you know, identifying with the topic of trauma. Uh, this is something we should probably follow up with, in which case then you would do an informal screening based on presentation. So of the two types of screening, a formal screening and an informal screening, most of the time the alcohol and drug counselor will typically be doing informal screenings on the fly based on presentation. When doing a screening, collateral contacts are extraordinarily important. So a collateral contact or a collateral is a person who may have information about the, pardon me, about the client situation and can serve to support or corroborate information provided by the client or may add new information about the client. Um, so uh, collaterals could be previous treating clinicians. Maybe the client is showing symptoms um, that are consistent with auditory or visual hallucinations. We notice that the client often seems to be responding to something visually that nobody else is seeing, or maybe we see the client talking to himself uh, as if he's having a conversation with somebody and nobody's there. And we ask the client, hey, I noticed you talking to somebody, what's going on? And the client freezes up and says, no, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm wondering if we could talk about this. No, and the client doesn't want to talk about it. But maybe we have a release of information and in contact with a previous treatment facility. We reach out, you know, to that counselor and the counselor says, oh, yeah, you know, this client, we actually gave a diagnosis of schizophrenia based on the fact they met all these uh, criteria. So a collateral here would be somebody that could corroborate that, yes, we do have information indicating this client has consistent uh, symptoms consistent with mental health and would benefit from further assessment. Residential staff members who are part of the team, but sometimes not participating at the clinical multidisciplinary team meetings, sometimes they are, uh, can also be very important sources of information because residential staff members are uh, seeing the clients in their living environment, in some cases in a more natural state, and they might be able to give us information that would corroborate, uh, corroborate or support that the client has a mental health condition. 
Uh, probation officers can be collateral contacts. Family members can be very useful collateral contacts. Uh, the key with any kind of collateral is that we can't talk about the client or the client's treatment unless we have a release of information first. When screening for mental health, one of the most important things to ask is about periods of abstinence. Sometimes mental health symptoms are triggered by intoxication syndromes, uh, meaning that the symptoms of intoxication mimic symptoms of mental health. If somebody has been using methamphetamine for the last 10 days and has barely slept, they will definitely be showing symptoms that would be consistent with a psychotic disorder. Uh, they probably will be all over the place, distracted, hearing things that other people aren't hearing, uh, showing disorganized thought. So in, in this case, the mental health symptoms may be from the intoxication itself. Sometimes chronic use of a substance followed by post-acute withdrawal synd syndrome, meaning symptoms after uh, they've gone through acute withdrawal, may also look like mental health symptoms. Uh, somebody who has an alcohol, a severe alcohol use disorder who has been drinking consistently for a very long time are going to show symptoms of either depression and or anxiety after they get through the acute withdrawal syndrome. That is going to be true of 90% of the people who have an alcohol use disorder. So in this case, if the person's only been sober for three days, then we need to try and determine are these mental health symptoms related to post-acute withdrawal. So the simple way you do this is to just ask, when's the last time you use substances? So when mental health symptoms persist during periods of abstinence, and typically when we're talking about a period of abstinence, we're talking about a period of greater than 30 days, meaning the person has not used any substances uh, or any intoxicating substances in more than 30 days. If that is the case, they have not used in more than 30 days and there are still mental health symptoms, that suggests doesn't guarantee, but it suggests that there is likely an underlying mental health condition. In some cases, it may be prudent to conduct a screening quickly upon entry to identify initial treatment needs, but then wait at least 30 days for a full mental health assessment, meaning that a client may come in, show symptoms consistent with depression, but they are withdrawing off of alcohol in a many, many years drinking habit. And what we may do here is provide them with an antidepressant and treat them for the depression, but wait for at least 30 days to try and determine are the symptoms of depression getting worse or are they getting better, and then do a full mental health assessment. But in short-term programs, like a 28-day inpatient treatment program for a substance use disorder, that may not be possible, in which case we may do the full mental health assessment earlier than that. Typically though, if symptoms resolve themselves in less than 30 days with abstinence from substances, then the symptoms are most likely substance induced, not mental health induced. And in that case, the primary treatment goal would be to maintain abstinence from substances. Now, as previously discussed in a previous lecture, we are going to treat a co-occurring disorder as a co-occurring disorder if it looks like a co-occurring disorder. Meaning that if a person comes in with an alcohol use disorder and they've only been sober for uh, six days and they're showing symptoms of anxiety, well, we're gonna treat the anxiety. Our psychiatrist may put them on a low level anti-anxiety medication. Uh, our client may learn techniques to cope with anxiety, learn deep breathing techniques to uh, be less anxious. We're gonna do all that stuff just in case there is an anxiety disorder. But again, if the symptoms of anxiety go away as the person's sober for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, then most likely the anxiety symptoms will have been substance induced. In which case then the psychiatrist may uh, withdraw the anti-anxiety medication and the drug and alcohol counselor may determine that the client has good coping skills and we're good to go. But if those symptoms of anxiety don't dissipate, uh, and after the person's been absent or sober for 30 days or longer, then we are going to include treatment of anxiety as part of the client's overall treatment plan. 
Now, when doing a screening, it is always better to err on the side of caution and recommend further assessment if there is any suspicion of a co-occurring disorder. It is much better to refer that person for a more in-depth assessment uh, versus feeling like, well, it could be, but it's probably not, so never mind. I'll just assume it's not and we'll wait and see what happens. Uh, you don't want to do that and then actually end up missing a real condition because you didn't have the correct information. So if you suspect there might be any indication of a co-occurring mental health disorder, then you are going to probably refer for further assessment. All right, then let's talk about further assessment for co-occurring disorders. So a screening is attempting to determine whether or not there might be mental health symptoms. And a screening is typically there to determine whether or not this person should be referred to for a more formal assessment. Assessments take uh, typically a longer period of time. And so rather than referring every single client to a full mental health assessment, we do a screening first to try and determine should this person get further assessed? If yes, refer. Uh, if no indication that there's any mental health condition, well then no, we don't need to do the mental health assessment. So when we refer somebody for an assessment, this is a much more formal process to define the nature of the clinical problem uh, versus identifying symptoms. So in a screening, we may see symptoms consistent with anxiety, but in a formal assessment, we may try to determine, are these actually anxiety symptoms? Or could this be anxiety symptoms that are consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, which is a much more serious condition? Uh, we would do the same thing with a medical assessment. You know, if the client with an alcohol use disorder is showing symptoms of fatigue, then we may refer that person to meet with a medical doctor and the medical doctor is gonna try and determine, are these simply fatigue symptoms or could this be liver disease for an example? So the assessment attempts to determine the nature of the problem and then treatment goals related to the nature of that problem. So if a client has PTSD versus anxiety, those are going to be different treatment goals. And an assessment may be used to determine severity level, meaning that we may be concerned that this client's mental health symptoms are severe enough that it warrants a higher level of care, a partial hospitalization perhaps, or a residential treatment program. And so the assessment may attempt to determine, is this something that the client um, can stay in substance use treatment and be treated here for, or is this something that uh, after the assessment, we say, yeah, no, the client needs to go to additional level of care. Uh, like an example might be an eating disorder. So if a client with a history of anorexia or an eating disorder um, says during a screening that yes, they've been restricting their intake of calories or they've been trying to exercise more uh, to compensate for calories and we do a full assessment and determine that the client is eating three times a day. Uh, she's just not eating enough. We may, and let's say it's, I don't know, a residential inpatient treatment program where there's enough support to do this, then we may decide to keep that person in substance use treatment. But uh, be monitoring food intake, uh, ask the client co to commit to eating a certain number of calories per day, and as long as that happens, the client can stay in substance use treatment. Uh, but we may have a client that we're concerned because uh, she's losing weight rapidly. We do a screening. Yes, there's a history of anorexia. Uh, she hasn't eaten in three days except for some fruit juice. Uh, we do a further assessment. We send out for blood levels. We see that her blood levels are abnormal because she's not eating enough calories. Then we may say, okay, this client can't stay in substance use treatment right now. We need to get her to a medical facility or to a residential eating disorder facility until we get the anorexia under control. And then she may be able to come back to our treatment facility. So the assessment is basically going into much more detail than the screening did to determine what exactly is going on with this person. Now note, an assessment may or may not lead to a formal mental health or medical diagnosis. Sometimes we refer somebody for further assessment and in doing the further assessment determine, no, this isn't actually uh, a mental health condition or uh, the symptoms of depression associated with uh, the client losing his favorite dog to cancer uh, is normal, and we're going to provide some additional support, but carry on with the primary substance use treatment goals. Now, alcohol and drug counselors 
can do an assessment for a co-occurring disorder. SAMHSA states that that is within the scope of practice for an alcohol and drug counselor. Most often this happens when practicing parallel integrate integration, meaning that uh, the, facility, the treatment facility, the substance use treatment facility has a sister relationship uh, with a mental health facility and they're working in parallel. In this case, the drug and alcohol counselor may do an assessment before referring that person to another agency. Uh, most of the time when an alcohol and drug counselor does a formal assessment, they will follow a structured interview or questionnaire that's more detailed than a screening. Uh, for example, the Beck Depression Inventory uh, is a, an evidence-based tool, assessment tool, that's used to determine the level of depression that a person has. As long as an alcohol and drug counselor has been trained on the Beck Depression Inventory, it is within their scope of practice to administer the Beck Depression Inventory, and then they may use that information uh, when connecting that client to a psychiatrist, for an example. Now in San Diego County, where I'm located, most of the time, the treatment facilities have multidisciplinary teams and there's usually a mental health clinician that either works full-time or part-time along with the treatment team. Most of the time, mental health clinicians will conduct the formal assessment. That's been my experience is that typically the alcohol and drug counselors do the screenings. In some cases, mental health clinicians do also. Uh, but then a full mental health assessment is usually done by a mental health clinician. However, an alcohol and drug counselor can do that assessment as long as they've been trained to do the assessment. In doing an assessment for mental health or for a co-occurring disorder, there is no single gold standard co-occurring disorder assessment tool, meaning there's no tool out there that's like the co-occurring assessment tool and everybody uses the co-occurring assessment tool. Uh, that doesn't happen. Most assessment tools narrowly specialize in specific mental health or substance use disorder factors, like the Beck Depression Inventory that I just mentioned. It's a great tool for assessing depression, uh, not such a good tool for assessing uh, psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, for example. Uh, the textbook that we use in the co-occurring disorders course at San Diego City College uh, is a publication from SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, uh, called TIP42, and they provide multiple assessment tools in the appendix that can be used by alcohol and drug counselors who've been trained to use those tools. But the best assessment tool is a comprehensive clinical interview with collateral sources, meaning that a comprehensive clinical interview asks a number of very detailed questions, typically more than a screening, about the nature of the mental health symptoms. We use collateral sources like previous treating facilities, family members, et cetera, to determine what treatments have been used, what works, what doesn't work, in order to come up with a plan. Now, if you are doing an assessment at your treatment facility for a co-occurring disorder, uh, you'll use whatever format your agency tells you to use. So if they have a formal questionnaire that they use for co-occurring assessments, well, then you should use that. But you always want to keep your clinical ears open, meaning that if you're asking a question from a standardized tool and the client's answer warrants follow-up questions to get clarification, then you should do those things. In the co-occurring disorders course that's taught at uh, San Diego City College in the alcohol and drug counseling program, uh, we typically focus on the screening as these are the types of assessments that most often the alcohol and drug counselors will do. Um, I'm gonna need some more specific feedback on my formative assessments. <clears throat> so, while I'm talking about screenings and assessments, in the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies program at San Diego City College in the Co-Occurring Disorders course, we do lots of scenario-based learning. This lesson is great to understand the concepts of doing screenings and assessments, but really in order for an alcohol and drug counselor to be prepared to go work out there in the field with clients, you need practice. So in the AODS program, what we do is we have students do a formalized screening questionnaire. Uh, we use the mental health screening form, uh, the third um, edition of that, and all of the students get a chance to practice doing that assessment with a typical client. We have uh, somebody play the role of the client, and the counselors give the assessment, and then they're given feedback. 
We also use scenario-based learning in which we create scenarios where the students are clients who are given a script on how to act uh, based on a certain type of presentation, and then the student trainees get a chance to practice doing screenings and assessments with those clients. Uh, and then we talk about what we determine from the screening, and there, it usually is a great discussion about things that the counselors did well and things that they could potentially improve upon. I highly recommend that anyone who's practicing to be an alcohol and drug counselor out there in the field, whatever your training program may be, that you get active scenario-based learning because there's nothing like actively learning of what this will look like when you're actually out there in order to see what it is that you know and what it is that you don't know. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about the ASAM criteria uh, and work here in San Diego County where we are located. So the American Society for Addictive Medicine, or ASAM for short, developed a particular type of assessment, the ASAM assessment, to identify criteria that are associated with different levels of problematic substance use. Uh, the criteria that the ASAM uses essentially establishes guidelines then for the type of treatment placement that's most appropriate meaning based on the answer to your assessment, it may be most appropriate for you to go to an outpatient treatment program, or maybe based on the answers, it's more appropriate that you go to an inpatient treatment program or a partial, partial hospitalization program. Through the use of the ASAM assessment, uh, using different questions, the client is given a score based on that criteria. Uh, to give a recommendation for the anticipated level of care and the risk levels for treatment planning. So ASAM's goal is to make standardized the treatment placement recommendations in order to make treatment planning more efficient. Here in San Diego County, uh, any substance use treatment facility that utilizes California drug Medi-Cal funding is required to use the ASAM assessment as criteria for providing and being reimbursed for services. Now note that California Drug Medi-Cal is a funder. There are many ways that treatment agencies get funded for the services that they provide. Not all treatment facilities use California Drug Medi-Cal funding. California Drug Medi-Cal funding is essentially state money uh, that's provided so that people who are in lower income brackets who might not otherwise be able to afford substance use treatment are able to get the substance use treatment that they need. And what happens is the treatment facility then submits a bill to essentially the state of California in order to get paid for the services that they're providing. Other treatment facilities uh, use insurance, uh, private insurance companies. So uh, if the client has Blue, Car Blue Cross Blue Shield, then the treatment facility will submit a bill to Blue Cl Cross Blue Shield and they will reimburse. Or maybe the client is private pay. Uh, they don't have insurance, but they're able to afford treatment. And so in this case, the client's given a bill and the client pays for it. So whoever's paying for the treatment is the funder. And funders are given a fairly large degree of latitude in terms of what they can ask for. So California Drug Medi-Cal has said, if you want our money, then you have to use the ASAM assessment in order to get reimbursed. The ASAM criteria uh, is something that is talked about in another course in the AODS program, the AODS uh, 156 case management course. Uh, this is just a quick example of determining dimensions. When I was talking about cutoff scores, there are questions related to acute intoxication or withdrawal potential, and based on the answers to those questions, uh, the client may be assigned a zero, a one, a two, a three, or a four. Uh, same thing with biomedical conditions and complications. Through a series of questions, the client will be scored at a zero, one, two, three, or four. And then based on these scores, uh, that determines client placement. So here's the thing. If you end up doing your internship or working for an agency that uses the ASAM criteria assessment, you will be trained at your job on how to do the ASAM criteria assessment. Uh, if you are working for an agency that doesn't use the ASAM criteria assessment, but they use a different type of screening and assessment, you're gonna get trained in whatever kind of screening and assessment they use. So a lot of times students uh, hear about these uh, screening and assessment tools and they're like, oh, the ASAM, I heard about the ASAM, what's the ASAM? Uh, don't worry about it. 
if it's relevant for you in the job that you do, then you will get learned and trained in that particular type of assessment as needed. All right, so that ends today's lecture on screening and assessment for co-occurring disorders. I hope you found this helpful and that you have the opportunity to practice in your training programs.